Hi there, I'm Jim Zirin. Welcome back for more Conversations. In June 2018, President Trump met with North Korea's Kim Jong-un in Singapore for about 45 minutes and signed a hastily drawn piece of paper touted as a start toward dismantling North Korea's nuclear arsenal. The language in the document mirrors previous unsuccessful agreements, but is in places even more vague. In his ensuing press conference, Trump announced some additional commitments, including plans to cancel U.S.-South Korean joint military exercises, strangely channeling North Korea in characterizing such drills as provocative war games. Since then, though Trump has declared he has neutralized the North's nukes, the sobering fact is that North Korea may be moving ahead with its nuclear-ready ballistic missile program at 16 hidden bases. With us to discuss these important developments is Ambassador Christopher Hill. Chris Hill was a career Foreign Service officer, having served presidents of both parties in a number of important diplomatic posts. He was the United States Ambassador to South Korea in the second Bush administration. From 2005 to 2009, he headed the U.S. delegation to the six-party talks, chaired by China, seeking an end to the North Korean nuclear threat. He is the author of a dynamite memoir of his global diplomatic experiences entitled Outpost, A Diplomat at Work, which is a must-read. I'm honored to welcome Ambassador Christopher Hill to this table. Well, Chris, uh, you're wonderful to come on. And in 2016, before he took office, uh, Trump met with President Obama, and uh, Obama told him North Korea was America's number one national security threat. Is it still? Yeah, I think it is. And frankly, I don't think the threat is going away. Uh, certainly, it's a better year in 2018 than it was in 2017 and when we had the threat of, uh, you know, nuclear war or something. But uh, clearly, uh, that's calmed down. But the problem is there's, frankly speaking, been no progress toward denuclearization. And uh, this is a problem that uh, will get worse uh, unless it gets a lot better. Well, in June, there was the first talk at the summit between North Korea and the United States. And President Trump went to Singapore and uh, he met with Kim Jong-un. Uh, what brought Kim Jong-un to the table? Well, I think uh, in 2017, the Trump administration did some very good things with Nikki Haley in New York, really pressing hard on sanctions and getting for the first time the Chinese to go along with sanctions on oil, uh, oil exports to North Korea. That was the first time they were able to do that. I think the North Koreans kind of extrapolated that trend, saw the U.S. and China working together on sanctions, and uh, decided they'd better try their own uh, political gambit, their own diplomatic effort. Effort, which they did and which they've been pretty successful at. Was uh, Trump's rhetoric effective, uh, talking about Little Rocket Man, yeah. and saying he was going to wipe North Korea off little the face Rocket of the earth? Man. Yeah, I, th I would say any progress we're, we're in 2017 was, uh, was in spite really of some no of that choice. rhetoric. I mean, the real progress, really again, was no in New York on sanctions. You know, uh, North Korea cannot, uh, they don't have the refinery weapon. capacity for what Exploded. they need in terms of Over gasoline. The so the, uh, the Chinese have been providing gasoline to them. And so when the Chinese agreed in New New York to start limiting gasoline, gasoline sales. I think that's when the when the North Koreans got got very worried. But in the meantime, we had all this talk about you know our buttons bigger than their button, et cetera. That was not very helpful, and frankly, made a lot of people worried. Namely, the South Koreans. Uh, it's one thing to hear the North Koreans saying bellicose things. It's another thing to hear people in the U.S. talking that way. Well, the North president. Koreans uh, reciprocated with their rhetoric. Rhetoric. They called Trump a dotar. I guess that means a senile old man. Yeah, that uh, sent a lot of people to their dictionaries. <laughs> uh, basically, you know, the North Koreans are what they are, and I think the South Koreans especially kind of just discounted that talk from the North Koreans. But when you start hearing the Americans talk about fire and fury and things like that, that's when people started getting very worried. And that's why the South Koreans were very anxious to see if they could calm it down. And, of course, don't forget that uh, when this was all happening, the South Koreans were very worried about how their Winter Olympics were going to go. A lot of European countries were sort of expressing misgivings about sending their best skiers and skaters uh, to go watch uh, North Korean missiles fly over, over their heads. Um, so uh, 
was Trump wrong to have uh, met uh, directly with Kim Jong Un? You know, when he did. You know, as a career diplomat, I always think it's a good idea for people to talk. I mean, Better than jaw, jaw, jaw. You got it. You got it. But the problem, of course, is there was so little preparation. And then when people tried to engage in preparation, you know, there were a couple of teams uh, under then CIA director Mike Pompeo going to North Korea, trying to work out some something that would look like a draft joint communique. Uh, you know, it was pretty clear the president just wanted to go in there and wing it. And the trouble is, you know, when you see two presidents have a summit and, boy, they pull a rabbit out of a hat and everyone says, my goodness, how they do that? And the answer is they had some professional diplomats working weeks and weeks to stuff that rabbit down the hat. So in this case, they didn't have that. And the consequence was that what they really announced in Singapore was, uh, you know, a lot less than met the eye. Well, uh, our uh, policy in approaching North Korea has always been to seek a complete, verifiable, irreversible, uh, uh, trustworthy denuclearization. Uh, did we get any closer to that as a result of the Singapore meeting? I'm sorry to say I don't think we did get uh, closer to that. I think it's important, though, to stand up to the North Koreans on this and make it clear, no, we're not going to allow them to become a nuclear nation. I mean, to become nuclear, uh, North Korea could create a circumstance where maybe the U.S. sometime in the future doesn't want to keep forces on the uh, peninsula. And if we're out of the Korean peninsula, we may soon be out of Japan. So I think the stakes are very high in terms of U.S. interests, U.S. presence in Northeast Asia. So I think the Trump administration was right to be tough on this point to insist that North Korea denuclearize. The problem is uh, how they've gone about it, uh, starting with the president and then I guess trying to have lower level meetings. Uh, and uh, frankly, the president, as you mentioned earlier, indicating that he was buying their line that somehow our joint exercises the only regret we should have about our joint exercises, we didn't have them in 1950, but uh, to s imply that those joint exercises are somehow provocative and therefore we should cancel them. I think those sent powerfully wrong signals to the North Koreans. They may have been intended as conciliatory signals and they came across to the North Koreans as signals of weakness. Now, uh, but the North Koreans uh, apparently have stopped testing. Uh, since the Singapore meeting. I mean, isn't that an item of progress or don't they need to test? Um, you know, they need to test at some time. Uh, they don't need to test at other times. I must say during my negotiations with the North Koreans that went on for about four years, when we were talking to the North Koreans, they never tested. There was uh, one hiatus in the negotiations. The North Koreans were furious at us for having impounded uh, a bank account of theirs down in Macau. And so during the time when they were refused to go to the talks, which lasted over a year, they actually tested what turned out to be a fizzle, uh, that is a nuclear uh, explosion that didn't really explode. So uh, when you talk to them, you tend to get a, a test moratorium, and I think the president was pleased that he got that. But that's not enough. You know, when you're developing solid uh, fuel missiles, when you're developing or perfecting a nuclear warhead, you don't necessarily have to test it every other day. You're, you're working on R&D. You're working on a lot of things. So I think the president tried to ballyhoo that as a major accomplishment when what we really need is for this young leader in North Korea, Kim Jong-un, to sign on to the idea that he needs to denuclearize and do it in a reasonable amount of time. And he's talked about denuclearizing but more in a sort of biblical sense of, you know, at the end of time, he'll somehow support denuclearization. The end but is at hand. It, but he has certainly not moved ahead on it. And I think the administration has a big problem uh, now at the end of uh, 2018. Now, when you negotiated with the North Koreans, it was during the reign of Kim Jong-un's father, Kim Jong-il, I guess up until the time that he fell ill. Uh, but uh, what approach did you use that was different from what seems to be happening now? Well, what we tried to do, uh, and it was an old uh, approach I used from my mentor, a guy named uh, Dick Holbrook, 
I was calling my mentor, my tormentor, but uh, Holbrook understood when you're trying to get some country to do something they don't want to do, don't expect them to take a leap of faith. Try to get them to move step by step. So basically, I tried to go step by step. First, let's agree that they've got to get rid of their nuclear weapons, do it in a timely way, rejoin the uh, Treaty of uh, Non-Proliferation, which is important because to rejoin that is to rejoin as a non-nuclear state, and then step by step work on uh, the actual implementation. So the next set of agreements had to do with shutting down the nuclear reactor, getting international inspectors there, taking some actions that would make it impossible in the short run to restart the nuclear reactor, step by step. In the meantime, we were providing some fuel oil that they needed to heat some of their buildings and run some of their industrial plants. So that was the idea. I think uh, President Trump perhaps doesn't have the patience for that, and so I think he had this idea that he could get a piece of paper in Singapore and all would be well. Well, he did get a piece of paper in Singapore, but symptomatic of the problem, you know, he named uh, uh, Secretary Pompeo as the guy who was going to go forward and get this done, and the North Koreans said, well, we'll name a player, uh, player uh, some later date. So it was pretty clear the North Koreans even came to Singapore without even an idea who was going to follow up on this. So. I, I don't think it was well prepared, and uh, diplomacy that's not prepared is just talk. It's not diplomacy. Do you find it uh, somewhat strange that North Koreans have such difficulty getting fuel oil, but uh, they have lots of uh, energy for, uh, for nuclear weapons? I mean, where are they getting that from? It is quite remarkable. Uh, obviously, they, they learned about nuclear weapons early on. You know, this didn't just start with the little rocket man epithet. I mean, they've been working on this since the 1960s. Uh, the Soviet Union gave them some technology. They got some from this Pakistani uh, nuclear smuggler named A.Q. Khan. They clearly did some trades in terms of their uh, uh, missile technology with some other countries to get various uh, nuclear technology. So this has been a pretty serious program of theirs. But you're absolutely right. I mean, I went to the uh, North Korea nuclear plant in Yongbyon, and to walk through it, as I did, they had just shut it off. So. Uh, I agreed to have a look at the place. Hmm. And to see it, I mean, it looked like some kind of old Eastern European uh, textile mill or something. Hmm. I mean, you couldn't really believe they were producing fissile material. But, you know, going back to the Soviet Union, we used to see a lot of things like that. You know, you land on an airplane in some uh, airport and a uh, horse and wagon comes to pick up the luggage. And you realize, you know, it's kind of a third world country in some respects, but there they are producing some of the world's best <laughs> missiles in other respects. So you it is a strange, uh, strange encounter when you go to North Korea and see what's going on in that country. Uh, you tr uh, to have an effective weapon, you of course need a delivery system. Uh, and are you troubled by this uh, recent development, which uh, Trump called fake news, that uh, they are uh, uh, developing missiles at 16 hidden sites? Yeah, this is not fake news, and the president should know better than to call that fake news. Uh, the U.S. government, through various uh, means, have known about these things for some time. And they should have been kind of pushing back on the North Koreans on this because, you know, the North Koreans have agreed to take some steps in denuclearization. But, you know, on the one hand, you know, random acts of kindness are a good thing. Random acts of denuclearization don't really mean a lot because it's not a product of negotiation. It's not a product of, you know, we'll see their list and we'll say, well, we want you to deal with this. And they'll say, no, we prefer to deal with that. And you can have a discussion. They have kind of randomly selected things. And in the meantime, uh, in, in, for example, decommissioning a missile launch site, they've created other missile launch sites, which is kind of inevitable. So, so I think these issues need to be jointly arrived at. And I guess the biggest problem with the whole negotiating process, if I can dignify it with a concept mm. that it's a process, <laughs> is that where are the other countries here? Where, where's, uh, where's South Korea, for example? The North Koreans seem to talk to them separately and seem to say different things to the South Koreans. Where are the Japanese who are close allies of ours? Do they really want to, you know, wait there at uh, Nuri? 
Merida Airport for our delegations to come back and then they can, you know, be briefed on what's going on. And finally, where's China? I mean, China, that's a serious player. And if you think it's tough to, if it's difficult to work with them, try working against them. And that seems to be what's in the offing now between China and the, U and the uh, Trump administration. Let's talk about uh, South Korea. You have a liberal president, Moon, South Korean politics, uh, the liberals seem to be more interested in getting a United States out of there and uh, yeah. uh, fending for themselves. The conservatives were more globalist, it seems. Uh, yeah, it is ironic, the, the liberals, if you will, or <laughs> progressives, if you will, tend to be more on this sort of pan-Korean idea and the idea that, gee, if, if only these great powers hadn't come to our peninsula, referring to the Soviet army and, and the U.S. and others, that somehow if only they Dean hadn't Russ come. Dean chopping the country. There you yeah. go. There you go. And back in 1945, <laughs> when we were trying to get the surrender of Japanese troops nor, uh, south of the 38th parallel to prevent a situation where the Soviet Union could have run the whole uh, peninsula. By the way, the Soviets entered the war after, after after we had dropped the first uh, atomic bomb in Hiroshima. So they were in a land grab, and I think the U.S. was right to try to stop that, and we were able to stop the land grab in the middle of the Korean Peninsula. Well, so Moon is a progressive. Uh, his two uh, conservative predecessors are in jail. Yes. Uh, you said he's building uh, confidence uh, measures uh, with uh, North Korea, but it's, it's more than uh, just talk. I mean, he's, uh, the recent right. reports are he's dismantling guard posts on the 38th parallel and uh, Correct. digging yeah. out landmines and, and yeah. making it much less of an embattled area. Right. Uh, so uh, he's moving uh, toward unification in a way that's outpacing denuclearization. Uh, There's no question that the peninsula cooperation, if you will, is outpacing denuclearization. And the South Korean government tries to be very careful to say that they cannot normalize with North Korea unless there's denuclearization. They try to keep that well tethered. But the fact is people see a lot of these moves on the ground and sort of wonder, uh, is that really what they're thinking? And then there are a lot of suspicions that the South Koreans think, look, we're not going to get them to give up their nuclear weapons, so why don't we try to normalize uh, with North Korea and convince the North Koreans in the context of normalization that they should consider giving up their nuclear weapons because they could get more if they did more denuclearization. Well, that's kind of putting the cart before the horse, and it's certainly not U.S. policy, and it sort of argues for, you know, a, kind of a, a deeper dive with the South Koreans well, on where we're both going. Sort of the Justice Scalia answer, I will consider it, but I won't. Yeah, uh, there, there you go. And, and then, as you point out quite rightly, the opposition party in South Korea, the more sort of internationalist party, if you will, the last two presidents who came from that party are serving 20-year sentences. So uh, that is odd to be sure. It's, it's not unprecedented in Korea. There was a, a time a few years ago where they had the same thing going on. But uh, I know a lot of South Koreans are kind of concerned about all that. Now let's talk about uh, another of the big stakeholders, uh, the elephant in the room, China. During the campaign, Trump said he was going to make China make North Korea give up their nuclear weapons. Uh, and you rightly pointed out that in the uh, uh, era of Nikki Haley, the Chinese uh, imposed sanctions on North Korea because of nuclearization. But then after Singapore, they appeared to ease sanctions. Uh, yeah. So what's going on there? I mean, uh, uh, Mike Pence went over there and uh, he said, well, they'll uh, reimpose sanctions maybe sometime down the road. But uh, I mean, first what's of all, going on? I think, first of all, I think it's been important that Mike Pence go over there because uh, back in, uh, in uh, the month of October, he uh, gave a speech at the Hudson Institute in which, according to many China watchers, that if you read his speech, it kind of showed a sense that somehow we want to start a Cold War with China. Uh, I think that should be the fur furthest thing from our minds. I mean, this is a relationship, frankly speaking, that is too big to fail. We have serious problems with China. We have strategic uh, military type problems. We also have rather legendary economic problems. But I think we're kind of doomed to, to talk to them and try to 
work these things out. Uh, so far, we're not doing a very good job kind of, of it. imposing sanctions on China. Yes, we're imposing sanctions on China, and I would say the only kind of concrete result of that whole Singapore process was that we've driven the Chinese closer to the North Koreans. I mean, you have to remember that Xi Jinping did not have a single meeting with his North Korean counterpart for some seven years, and then in the run-up to Singapore, he had three meetings with Kim Jong-un. So uh, I think China is in the game, and I think we need to acknowledge that. And to try to deal with China uh, through a series of sort of after-action reports, I don't think it's really going to work. China has a real interest there. So I hope that uh, there'll be some effort to maybe uh, uh, resolve or address some of these trade problems, but get on to the main event, which is nuclear weapons in the Korean Peninsula. Well, is China likely to help us on North Korea nuclearization? I mean, I, yeah. I would have thought uh, that China players would uh, say if uh, there's denuclearization, the U.S. has won, and if the U.S. wins, China loses. Yeah, I think the Chinese don't want North Korea to have nuclear weapons. They've said so about a million times. I think they believe it. The issue really is how does China feel about U.S. troops on the Korean Peninsula? You know, a few years ago, we had a Secretary of Defense, with uh, Donald Rumsfeld, who thought it was a good idea to talk about those U.S. troops and whether they could have third country missions, i.e. missions against China, which is not exactly what the Koreans wanted to hear because the Koreans look, on their, look over their border, they see China, and they don't want to, uh, you know, create some kind of historical problem with their neighbor. You know, you can pick your friends and allies, but you can't pick your neighbor. So the South Koreans were kind of worried about some of this kind of belligerent talk out of uh, Washington. And so um, to this day, I think uh, the South Koreans want to be assured that our troops in Korea are there to defend uh, uh, Korea and not uh, add to problems with, uh, with China. Again, I think we need to have a discussion with the Chinese. We need to tell them that if there were a demise of North Korea, for example, and there are many Chinese who worry if North Korea goes down, this is a victory for America, a defeat for China. They worry whether we put troops up on the Yalu River, whether we have listening posts uh, up there. I think we need to make some assurances to the Chinese that we would not take any strategic uh, advantage from China in the event that there were some kind of uh, demise of, of North Korea. China, they don't like the North Koreans. I mean, that's very clear. Uh, you know, as problematic as things have been in China recently with Xi Jinping declaring uh, uh, essentially being president for life and the effect, the downstream effect this has had on the on political tensions there, I, I think you're hard pressed to find Chinese who say North Koreans, they're our friends. So it does speak to the fact that we need to step up our dialogue with them and make sure they understand what our objectives are. And for people who say, oh, we've already told them that, well, you know, I think any advertiser knows if you haven't told someone something a hundred times, you haven't even told them once. So, so uh, advantage to repetition. Yes. <laughs> but even in diplomacy, I mean, like selling soap, I mean, you just keep going after your consumer on that. But if we're engaged with them in a trade war, I mean, is it a good time to have a trade war with someone who we want to help us well, on an important issue? It's our, never, our, it's, in fact, our, our preeminent yeah. national security issue. It's never a good time to have a trade war. Now, that said, China has been running enormous uh, surpluses with us for many years which I would say are unsustainable, politically unsustainable. China has become a symbol to many Americans of economic dislocation, of economic uh, uh, problems, frankly. So I think China needs to understand that running those huge surpluses is a problem. I know it's not an economic problem, but it is certainly a political problem. There needs to be a discussion of that. More importantly, in my view, is China's uh, lack of respect for intellectual property rights. And here, I think the U.S. has missed an opportunity in having a close relationship with the Europeans, such that Europeans plus U.S. can be approaching the Chinese in a coordinated way. But we have created all kinds of problems uh, with Europe over uh, threats of a trade war. So we go back to Singapore, uh, where we may not have uh, thought uh, one uh, step ahead. Uh, former Secretary of State uh, Jim Baker said the one 
one thing we must not do with North Korea is uh, make concessions to them in exchange for a promise that they'll give us something down the road. Well, uh, the track record hasn't been good. Well, you know, I would say what we tried to do during the Bush uh, administration, uh, and frankly back even further in the Clinton administration, is you do something, they do something. You do something else, they do something else. You never do everything and expect them to come through uh, with their side of the bargain, nor can you expect them to do everything and then wait till the end and come through with your uh, part of the bargain. So there has to be a sequencing of these issues and a sort of careful choreography of how, of how you're going to do it. And I frankly don't think we've uh, you know, been able to accomplish that principle uh, with the North Koreans. And so the Chinese, I think, are worried about where we're going with this. And frankly, with sanctions, you're either tightening them or loosening them. And right now, it's pretty clear the Chinese are loosening them. So I have a question for you, uh, Ambassador Christopher Hill. Uh, do you think Kim Jong-un played Donald Trump in Singapore? You know, I'll leave that to others. Uh, I can tell you, though, he left North Korean interests very much intact. And I don't think he really reached any kind of strategic understanding uh, with our president. Uh, you know, and our president tried to say, look, uh, think of all the beachfront condos you can build in uh, North Korea. And I think those kinds of comments just went way over the head of the North Koreans. So the concern I have is uh, the Trump administration really tried to show its cards and to try to be positive. And I think the North Koreans took them as gestures of weakness. So no beachfront condos. Chris Hill, thank you so much for coming by. This has thank been you. just wonderful. And thank you for coming by. Tune in next week for more conversations. I'm Jim Zirin. Take care and all the best.